Hey guys, today we are covering the Mint 400, an amazing race in the Nevada desert that a lot of you may know from Hunter S. Thompson's account in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, but there is so much more to it so as much. we found out. Let's quit wasting time and dive deep. Plus, we got a bunch of really good riffs in this one, so if you like laughing and stuff, then you're going to love this one. We got more riffs than Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> it's past gas. The video. <laughs> In some circles, the Mint 400 is a far, far better thing than the Super Bowl, the Kentucky Derby, and the Lower Oakland Roller Derby Finals all rolled into one. This race attracts a special breed, wrote Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Thompson had been assigned to cover the 1971 edition of the Rally Through the Mojave for Sports Illustrated. But the Vegas Thompson encountered was far from the one we know today. This was old Vegas. Neon lights, nickel slots, and $2 stakes amid the rough and tumble lawlessness of the desert. It's in this colorful tapestry that the Mint 400 emerged as a casino promotion that would become a vital part of North American off-road racing. How did a bunch of hospitality industry employees with little to no knowledge of motorsports turn a publicity stunt into the great American off-road race? Why did the Mint 400 go dark after 20 successful years? And what about this uniquely Vegas race ensured its eventual comeback? Buy the ticket and take the ride, because today on Pass Gas, it's the story of the Mint 400. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We're driven by the search for better, and listeners of the show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Past Gas. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Just go to Indeed.com slash Past Gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Past Gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Man, you got to be tougher than a $2 steak to race the Mint 400. <laughs> that sounds like something they'd say. I think that's the same. Yeah. Tougher I than a $2 it. steak? Yeah. I need a 2 I mean, back so in the hungry. 70s, a $2 steak was probably like, that for Jeez. inflation, it's probably like $18, yeah. I want to say. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I'm just a YouTuber. I'm just a guy. It. I won't. Welcome back to Pass Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. I am joined, as always, by my co-hosts. Rocking the Toyota Racing T-shirt today, James Pumphrey. Give me back my son. And we've got Joe Weber. What the heck is up, Wing Wing Nation? I'm so freaking excited for this. For this. I have a pitch. What? What if we gave Joe a uh -huh. soundboard? Oh, no. Thanks. I don't like soundboards. No? Okay. <laughs> well, then, never mind. We shot that down <laughs> I, I wanted to spur some conversation. What, what would be on it? And I would be controlling it? Yeah. Uh, just sounds and fun things. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll try it, I guess. Because as I was saying your name, I was thinking Joe Weber on the ones and twos. I didn't yeah. say oh, that, yeah. but I was You'd like, oh, man, that. that would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, It'd be all right. And then I would, like, scratch or something. Oh, it's yeah, you do one DJ scratch. <laughs> yeah. You do your DJ shadow thing and real Jimmy quick. would have to set up, like, heavy-ass turntables. <laughs> I want two of them, <laughs> even though I'm only going to be using one. <laughs> yeah. And then he has to tear it down. You've got to keep. You're and not even like visible like, behind your stack yeah. of yeah. equipment and crates and yeah. crates yeah. of records that you have to pack up every uh, Friday when we record. Crates of records, but then it's uh, Serato, so I only use the like yeah. controller. <laughs> Hell yeah! So, so you do. We should all represent one of the five elements of hip hop. Oh yeah! You should do scratching. Yeah. I'll do graph. Yeah, graph. Well, we, it's a tagging. it's an audio format, yeah. so graph and dancing we just don't, don't yeah. need. So you do rapping, and okay. I'll do beatboxing. Okay, cool. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So between uh, the three elements of hip hop, <laughs> <laughs> three white guys the on three, a podcast, the three audio, <laughs> the three audio elements, elements of hip hop. We do need a name for our new podcast. 
We do. Er- I er- think er- er- ever. So well, no, yeah. Now you're jumping into my territory. Sorry, dude. That's beatboxing. Dude. <laughs> you do it with the. Turn you gotta tables. do it with the equipment. Yeah. James does everything else with yeah. his yeah. mouth. Yeah. But that's now true. you're encroaching on my. Oh uh, yeah. That's mine. So I won't scratch. <laughs> I won't make scratch noises with my yeah. mouth, but you don't make any noises with your mouth. Yeah. And you, you only do words. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Man. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Get the f- out oh, of sorry, my ah, business, dude. Ah. What are you doing, dude? Got a target on my back. <laughs> Just coming for me, bro. I got like really lightheaded. Oh, dude, I was gonna say, don't hyperventilate. <laughs> five, f- five, bro, three furious elements of hip hop. Every. Okay. We uh, can take it what to you guys, Vegas. Yeah, we could. Where we would also do some racing. What do you guys know about the Mint 400? Off, I off know, the top of your head. Well, that's what Hunter S. Thompson was covering when he did yeah. Fear and Loathing. I think it was for the 1971 issue of Sports Illustrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I know about that. I was always surprised. Like, I remember when I was a kid and, like, I feel like every boy my age, like, at one point in his life was like, you know what, I'm like... I'm really into Hunter S. Thompson. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was always into cars and motor stuff. And so when I finally started reading uh, Fear and Loathing when I was like 12, I saw that it, he was covering like a motorsport race. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. I have a this right is... to like this more than my <laughs> peers even do. <laughs> I like drugs and motorbikes. Yeah. Uh, the. Roommate I was telling you about before, the guy that resembled a shark when he was hungry. Okay, yeah. Uh, every time he comes into town, he's like, oh, what are you guys doing at Donut? You guys should cover the Mint 400. So yeah. this episode is dedicated to Aaron Chassis. I feel like it's been one of our most uh, requested things to make a video yeah. or a podcast about. I, because I think it's like the Mint 400 is the first level of obscurity mm-hmm. yeah. that someone is like, hey. You know what you guys should know about yep. mm-hmm. is this thing that everyone actually knows. The iceberg. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doubt it. Like after a little bit of research, it does seem brutal. And oh, at first, yeah. I was like, I want to do this, and now I'm like, oh. definitely. I, and I've, we, I think everyone at Donut has had that same mm-hmm. realization yeah. where it's like, oh, it's not the Baja 1000. It's meant 400. It's 400. Yeah. <laughs> <How> <laughs> the number's smaller. We could probably do that mm-hmm. as guys. Yeah. And then like Jesse, our chief creative officer, is like. From the beginning, he's like, there's no way you could do that. Dude. Yeah. Off-road racing is a whole other caliber of endurance and engineering. Everything is built to not only be fast, but be fast and not break out in the middle of the desert and leave you stranded so yeah. you don't mm-hmm. die. Like, that's how serious it is. The man who would go on to build and own the Mint Casino, which in turn would create the Mint 400. This guy was named Delbert Eugene Webb. <laughs> Nerd. He was born in Fresno, California, one of the best places ever, in 1899. And he went by Dell because he hated being called Delbert for some I reason. Why? Did he start at Del Taco? <laughs> Even like Bert's a, kind of a cool name. Dell's kind Bert's of a cool great. name. Del's Delbert. A cool name. Delbert is. Del, uh, Del Warsham, shouts out. Uh, as a child, Del learned carpentry from his father, who owned a sand and gravel business. But when Dell was just 14, his father's business went bankrupt and his family's fortune was lost. Because realize, people realized that you could go find sand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's rocks outside. <laughs> <laughs> and Dell was forced to drop out of school to help support his family. And two years later, Dell set off on his own, working as a carpenter and playing semi pro baseball. Oh, we were just talking about semi pro baseball. Rocket City Trash Pandas. In 1925, Dell's major league dreams were dashed when he severely injured himself on a slide into home plate. Injured during a game. This incident, combined with a bout of typhoid fever oh my lord, that required months of hospitalization, spelled the end of his baseball career and pushed Dell into working construction full time. At the advice of his doctor, Dell moved to the warm, dry climate of Arizona. You hear about that a lot, like back in the day, where it's like, yeah, then they moved to... <laughs> 
because the climate was better yeah, for their, their ailment. consumption. Like that yeah. never happens anymore no. at all. Can you imagine getting food poisoning and the doctor's <laughs> like, you should probably move the. Phoenix. You should probably <laughs> move there and pray. Yeah. Those are that's your medicine. Move the, I don't know. Maybe like it's the humidity that's making you <laughs> shit yourself to death right now. <laughs> While working for a contractor in the Phoenix we area, we don't know what's going on in there. <laughs> Dell's paycheck bounced, and the contractor skipped town. But Dell was in the middle of building a grocery store, and the grocer wanted him to finish the job. So Dell took over the contractor's defunct business, and over the next few years, turned the assets left behind: one cement mixer, ten wheelbarrows, ten pickaxes, and twenty shovels and into 55 the fifty-five burgers. Fifty-five. <laughs> <laughs> I know, very specific. Into one of the world's largest construction businesses, the Dell E Web Construction Company. You've seen that on the side of a cement mixer. In 1945, Dell's success led to a version of his dream of playing professional baseball. He and his two partners bought the New York Yankees. What? What? In the Dude, 20- I show we were just talking about Yankees too. That's crazy. Oh my God, so many connections. In the 20 years of his, <laughs> in the 20 years of his ownership, the Yankees won 15 American League pennants and 10 World Series yeah, championships. Yeah, this is this is their big run right here. Following this acquisition, he met Babe Ruth. Oh, yeah. No, Babe Ruth is gone by, like, 30s. Damn it. Do you think he met DiMaggio? Yeah, probably. He met him? Yogi Berra, maybe? Did he meet Marilyn Marilyn Monroe? Marilyn Monroe? Um, Tell us, Joe. What do you think, Joe? uh, Marilyn Monroe was dating him in the 60s. Yeah, that was a lot. When it was like, oh, was she also hooking up with JFK? Uh, Well, JFK wasn't alive for a lot of the 60s. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) Following this acquisition... Uh, Dell began his first foray into Las Vegas when mobster Benjamin Bugsy Siegel mm-hmm. hired him as the general contractor for the Flamingo. Hey, you gonna build my casino, eh? Nah. 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 However, <laughs> Dell's construction managers weren't getting paid for their work on the famous hotel. Dell went to Bugsy personally and delicately asked him for the money. Bugsy immediately reassured him, saying, You'll get paid. See, don't worry about it, eh? We mobsters only kill each other. <laughs> Bugsy was right on the money about that because he was killed by the mob less than a year after the Flamingo opened. Oh, ah, Annette Benning, help me. <laughs> Dell went on to build the Sahara Hotel and the Mint in Vegas, and in 1961, his company bought both properties. The Nevada Gaming Commission was thrilled. They hoped Dell's publicly traded corporation would attract legitimate businessmen to Las Vegas. The early 60s saw the Mint's profile rise. In 1962, two of country westerns' biggest female stars headlined the Merry Mint Theater, Loretta Lynn with the Wilburn Brothers and Patsy Cline. Loretta would be a cute That's a good name. That's a good name. That's a little too... It's a little too old too we're talking about. Too folksy. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like definitely like... Give it like five years. A though. millennial names their kid Loretta. And Henry. Mariah, Henry. And Loretta and Oliver. Henry. We Oliver. hate Henry's around here. I love yeah. the name Henry. Henry's a great name. Everyone's named Oliver now. It, it, that's true. It I think like the Chloe has one. like three Olivers. Number one name is Noah. Number, eh. one, number one name for, I looked it up. Number one name for boys in 2023. I wasn't Noah. doubting that. I was just like, okay, big boat. Big boat. Yeah, whatever. He was an alcoholic. <laughs> Elvis's 1964 film, Viva Las Vegas, <laughs> featured an appearance by the Mint, and in 1965, an additional hotel tower was added to the proper, property, briefly making the Mint the tallest building in the Las Vegas Valley. Do you know what? Don't tell Trump that. Do you know what Elvis's <laughs> favorite sandwich was? Peanut yeah. butter and bugs. No, it's called the <laughs> Fool's Gold Loaf, uh-huh. and it was a whole loaf of bread with a pound of bacon, peanut butter, and jelly. And he one time was craving it so much that he flew to Denver in the middle of the night to get one of these loaves. Wow. Mm. The oldest active off-road race in the United States had its inspiration south of the border in the Baja 1000. In 1967, Norm Johnson, the assistant promotions and publicity director for the Mint, had read a story about off-road fanatics racing from Tijuana to La Paz. Uh, named after Andy. Yeah. Who designs our apparel. At the time, Norm was prepping for the Mint's annual deer hunting contest and wanted... Dude, that'd be so fun. Deer hunting contest? From a hotel. Oh, you shoot from the <laughs> hotel? <laughs> yeah. No, but I bet there's like dinners. Like I yeah. would love to go to a hotel in Vegas in the 60s yeah. for a deer hunting expedition. That'd be sick. Yeah. But there's dinners... 
There's themed gambling, drinks, there's cigars, gambling, there's whiskey. Cigars, whiskey, yeah. women. Mm. I would love that. Sauce. <laughs> But there's so much demi glaze. I bet it'd be so much easier to meet like Nat King Cole or Elvis yeah. just walking around a casino yeah. back then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially because they're dead now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be almost impossible. Yeah. Big thank you to Subaru for sponsoring this episode. For anyone who believes that life is about the journey, not the destination, discover the 2024 Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness. Adventure is a big part of an active lifestyle, but sometimes you gotta push it to the edge. The Subaru Crosstrek has always appealed to the adventure seekers with its legendary standard symmetrical all-wheel drive. But now, the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness goes even further. An enhanced dual-function X-Mode combined with 9.3 inches of ground clearance gives increased capability. Tough new off-road wheels with all-terrain tires designed for even more daunting trails. This trusty Subaru is built to take you to the limit, and yet its retuned standard eyesight driver assist technology is there to watch over you. Bold accent colors and new rugged exterior houses its equally durable water-repellent StarTech seats in a surprisingly spacious cabin. When I saw Subaru first introduce their wilderness line, I was like, when are they gonna do the Crosstrek? And now since it's been revealed, dude, this thing looks dope. Give it a look. This thing is super versatile and capable. It's at home, on the road, or out in the bush, helping you with your camping trip. The Wilderness is the top of the Crosstrek range. You're not going to be able to buy a more capable Crosstrek from the dealer. you got to go with the Wilderness. Discover the Subaru Crosstrek Wilderness, the newest member of Subaru's Wilderness family. Adventure on the edge. Learn more at Subaru.com. EyeSight is a driver assist system that may not operate optimally under all driving conditions. The driver is responsible for safe and attentive driving. System effectiveness depends on many factors. See your owner's manual. Big thanks to Pro Eagle for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. If you're an off-roading enthusiast or just hit a curb every once in a while, you've got to check out Pro Eagle. Pro Eagle is a brand born from off-road racing, offering off-road jacks and accessories that are tried, tested, and trusted by the best in the business. Pro Eagle is not just a manufacturer, but an industry pioneer. Did you know they invented the off-road jack back in 2013? That's right, they were the first to market, and they've been lifting the off-road community to new heights ever since. They even won Best New Off-Road Product at SEMA. But Pro Eagle doesn't just sell jacks. They offer a full line of accessories such as mounts, weather covers, lift adapters for Rivian, height extensions, and even a jack lock that will turn your jack into a safe jack stand. As someone who's done a minor bit of off-roading, I really put a lot of trust in jacks, and Pro Eagle jacks, I can trust them because all these pro teams use them, offering a model for every use from those smaller than a thermos to jacks made to lift big diesel trucks. Pro Eagle has the perfect off-road jack for you. Plus, you get peace of mind with your purchase, thanks to Pro Eagle's industry-leading two-year warranty. Go to ProEagle.com and use code DONUT for 15% off your order. That's 15% off ProEagle.com with code DONUT. Thanks, Pro Eagle. He was approached by two Las Vegans, Leroy Wickman and John Sexton, who were building dune buggies and suggested he purchase one for the contest. What the heck, dude? This is so fun sounding. <laughs> but yeah, we're just building dune buggies. Yeah. You want one? Isn't that what the Manson family was doing too? Were they? They loved their dune buggies. Dune buggies are sick, dude. I've <laughs> uh, They're universal. Yeah. You know, yeah. from Vegas guys shooting I've stuff. I've been really to into Myers Manx's lately. Shooting stuff. Myers Manx's. Oh, yeah. Lately? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I want one one day. Yeah. Definitely cool, like, on my drive. When you down have to the a beach. couple acres, it would be fun. So fun. Or Bop like around. if I had a beachfront property. <sighs> dude. For sure. Bop property. it around. That's exactly. You got to have, you got to live in a place that's can, that is good for bopping around. Yeah. I don't want to, it's not for extended drives. This <clears> is just for bopping. Yeah. Around. All I do is zoom and commute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either I'm zooming or commuting or running errands. <laughs> but I don't. Or I, doing many other things behind the wheel. Well, I barely, I rarely mm. bop, is what I'm saying. Mm. I really yeah. bop around. Yeah. You know? I need a good bopper. At the time, Norm was prepping for the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brainstorming led to the mint buying one of the dune buggies, but not for a prize. They would use it to send his builders, Wickman and Sexton, on an off-road journey from the Mint to Lake Tahoe Sahara Hotel, another resort in the company's portfolio. That's fun. In the blazing heat of August 1967, Las Vegas Mayor Oren Gragson. <laughs> Oren's a good name. 
Uh, it makes me think of that weird character on Parks and Rec. Yeah, I was just about to say that. Is it? And yeah. I knew a guy named Orrin who was exactly like was that. Was weird? Yeah. Really? yeah. That okay. kid was okay. in my okay. improv two for 201 two. class. Oh. Orrin. Oh. Uh, an official NASCAR timer saw them off. Dude, I think current NASCAR driver Noah Gregson is related to Orrin Gregson. Cool. Yeah. Grew up in Las Vegas. Noah, most popular name of 2023 for boys. Wow. Everything is connected. Yeah. Wickham, Sexton, and a press photographer took off in the two dune buggies packed with camping gear. Six days later, they reached their destination. News of the stunt spread fast. Norm decided to up the ante. He wanted to host a Baja 1000 of his own Hell right yeah, in the Mojave. That's sick. With a budget of $25,000 approved by the Mint Brass, Sexton and Wickham began to lay out a course north of Las Vegas. While setting up twenty five grand now wouldn't buy you a buggy. Yeah, it no. would. No, shitty one. <laughs> Not a new one. While setting up the 400-mile loop, they needed, a secu- they needed to secure permission from over 60 individual landowners. This group included Howard Hughes who peed in jars and stuff. <laughs> and he was, luckily wasn't an obstacle as he happened to be good friends with Del Webb. Oh, that's good. Ah, I'm actually good friends with Del Webb. <laughs> we peed in jars many a time. Look how long my toenails are. <laughs> <laughs> Once the Bureau of Land Management approved the event with a $10 fee per vehicle, the Mint 400 was a go. Sick. To drum up interest, Norm got his old racing buddy, Parnelli Jones, to compete in the event. By 1968, Rufus Parnell, Parnelli Jones, (laughs) was already a legend in the world of racing. He is the first driver to ever crack 150 miles per hour in the Indianapolis 500 qualifying and won it all at the Brickyard in 1963. Do you think Rufus is too folksy? Rufus is a cool name. Yeah. Call him Ruf. Because I always, I, I know I'm going to turn my kid's name into a single syllable. Yeah, mm-hmm. just don't call him Rufy. No. Nah. Yeah, see, you can't do Rufus. Call him Fussy. You also got to, like, have considerations <laughs> for what school children will make fun of your kid with. I yeah. don't know if that's as much of a thing as it was when we were kids. <sighs> that's true. Mm-hmm. But, I, I don't know, kids are brutal, dude. Are they? They were when we were kids. I think there's. I think they still are. I don't know if they are. I think once they turn like in their preteens and they're like, we gotta be like, oh yeah, conscious of stuff. But like a four year old doesn't care. I think kids now, from what I've heard on TikTok by like teachers and stuff, mm-hmm. kids are mean to adults now, mm-hmm. and they're nice to each other. Mm-hmm. Which <laughs> I wish that was the case when I was a kid. <laughs> Coming off his final Indianapolis 500, the news of Jones's entry nearly doubled the field of 56 entrants to 109 cars and motorcycles. Wow. Joining Jones was the experienced but less decorated NASCAR driver, Mel Larson. Uh, I used to know a girl named Mel. That's a good name. In addition to competing in NASCAR, Larson had also worked for the series as a public relations director. With the additional attention these competitors brought by race day, the overall purse had swelled from a guarantee of $15,000 to over $30,000. With inflation equates to $270,000 today. Holy Moses. Pretty good. I tell you what, boy. I'd love that. Yep. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. (laughs) Despite the increased publicity, much of the staff working the big event had zero experience in putting together a race. Great combination. Yeah. These were casino executives with backgrounds in hospitality, which made for some interesting assignments, like the hotel sales manager being in charge of timing at the start-finish line, (laughs) or an assistant manager heading up the impound and parade lineup. Huh. Learn by doing. Learn by doing. This seems just like Mm say-by-the-bell summer. Trial, (laughs) Trial by fire. It's like White Lotus. (laughs) <laughs> oh, will you be staying around for the rally? <laughs> <laughs> On race day, Fremont Street, the heart of downtown Las Vegas at the time, was blocked off as all vehicles lined up in front of the Mint. Del Webb, joined by Nevada's lieutenant governor, waved the starting flag. A six-mile parade to the starting line followed, and the Mint 400 Del Webb Desert Rally was on. 
I was just at Fremont Street a couple months ago, and one of their is big, that old Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah. It's all it's covered by like the LED screen now. It uh-huh, has yeah. like jets and oh, space stuff. Okay, but jets one of their and space stuff. One of their big attractions is like getting the dead skin eaten off your feet by fish. Nice. I just would never like. I don't want to take my there. shoes off in public <laughs> in Las Vegas on like a gross street. Yeah. yeah. Let alone have people watch fish eat dead skin off my feet. <laughs> and dip your dead yeah. skin in that dead skin. In the water. same water yeah. that Ew, other yeah, people yeah. It's like yeah. a soup. Awful. The, yeah. the, the fish are swimming in a soup of their own <laughs> <drink. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> No thank you. Ah. <laughs> uh. But it wasn't that simple. Some drivers got lost along the parade route, while others broke down. Before the race had even begun, the streets of Las Vegas had claimed eight entrants. Oh, my God. This confusion led to vehicles getting mixed up and made life even more difficult for that sales manager timing racers. But all in all, 101 cars and motorcycles took off on the 400-mile loop through the Mojave Desert. Norm listened to radio reports all night. Cars were lost, people were injured, and there were plenty of rollovers. A motorcyclist from Chicago had to walk 10 miles back into town, dragging his bike along with him. Yeesh. That sucks. I wouldn't. wouldn't Just leave it there. Why didn't he use his freaking cell phone? (laughs) (laughs) Another entrant and a pickup truck were forcefully changed both in engine and transmission, only to end up buried in a sand dune. Where did he get them? (laughs) A couple of web construction higher-ups who entered were forced to walk six miles after a breakdown, but returned to the Mint Hotel buzzing about competing in the next Mint 400. And the race hadn't even had its first finisher yet. Dude, what a time to be alive. Everything sucks now. <laughs> <laughs> you could do this. Huh? If you wanted to, you could yeah, do you something could like this. Now? Does. I just yeah. feel like the vibe would be different. A little bit, but there's still like vintage classes of like uh, building a VW Bug. You can Ooh, do that. You don't have to build bug. like a. You don't have to build like a trophy bug. You can still build something that uses a lot of stock components. I know, but like I would be driving in an old thing. But mm-hmm. like returning back to Vegas, like buzzing and like sitting at the mm-hmm. bar would feel different than now. I just think everything sucks now, and mm-hmm. I wish that I was born in a different time. It'd be the mm-hmm. same, except you'd be playing that like, what's different in each picture game at the mm-hmm. bar? It's the same. It's the same. <laughs> yeah, some of those bars haven't really been up. Upgraded. No, I went to a very old, not updated bar. Yeah. The Palace Station. Mm. It's kind of gross. I ate there. <laughs> What'd you eat? <laughs> it was Little a tiny fish. <laughs> I, it was a buffet, and I was like, I shouldn't get those baked mussels. Oh, I did. I did. It. No. Okay. But I got some Ooh. breadsticks and stuff. Okay. <laughs> Can't really mess those up. Typhoid fever. <laughs> the first finisher would come in the darkness of early morning. <laughs> yeah, at twelve twenty seven AM <laughs> nice only it's Vegas. What stays in Vegas? At twelve twenty seven AM, the first competitor crossed the finish line on Fremont Street. J. N. Roberts, part of the team with Gunnar Lindstrom, riding a Husqvarna motorcycle. Nice. They were slowly joined by other motorcyclists who all seemed to beat the hotel staff's estimated time schedule. At sunrise, the first four-wheeled vehicle made it back to downtown Las Vegas. Gene Hurst in a dune buggy. Upon completion of his 400 miles, Hurst accelerated by lighting a pipe. See? Different times! You could still light a pipe. No! (laughs) Now you gotta smoke meth. (laughs) (laughs) Of the 101 vehicles that started the race, only 32 finished. Wow. Ironically... Racing veterans Parnelli Jones and Mel Larson were not among them. Can you imagine how much different like Venice Boulevard or Venice, mm. California would oh, be yeah. without meth? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> but the race was a success. National, it'd be great. National magazines, sports writers, and television crews from all over covered the event. Naturally, Bill Bennett. The general manager of the Mint Hotel announced that a second Mint 400 would take place the following year. Yay! Yay! We did it. 
1969 Mint 400 had a quadrupled budget and a more refined course. Though it was still held on the northern outskirts of Las Vegas, the starting point was Tool Springs, near a gun club owned by the Mint Hotel. Instead of one large 400-mile lap, the race would be four laps of 50 miles staged over two days with overnight repairs allowed for the vehicles. Not as fun. Again... Parnelli Jones participated, but this time he was joined by 188 total entrants, including more big names from the world of motorsports and Hollywood land, such as Mickey Thompson, nice. nicknamed Mr. Speed. He was the first American to unofficially break the 400 miles per hour barrier at Bonneville. You had Bobby Unser, the reigning Indy 500 champ, and his brother and fellow racer, Al, who we've talked about, both of them previously. Mm-hmm. Yet actor Lee Majors, still a couple of years away from his best known role as the six million dollar man. And you also had finally actor and racing aficionado Steve McQueen, fresh off the success of Bullet, which featured McQueen racing through the streets of San Fran in a Ford Must. I love Sleeve McQueen. Mustang. <laughs> That's in the name of your Steve McQueen flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like uh, that green. <laughs> <laughs> that year, the number of finishers increased, but only 39% of racers finished all 400 miles. The motorcycle team of Mike Patrick and Phil Bowers won overall, making it two straight victories for bikes. By 1970, the purse had increased to $50,000, close to four hundred dollars today, and the number of vehicles grew again to 287 entrants. Mike Patrick and Phil Bowers won again, this time on a Yamaha, the first back-to-back Mint 400 champs. The following year, the race saw its first local win as Las Vegas native Max Switzer, as part of the team with 1968 winner J.N. Roberts, won on a Husqvarna motorcycle. However, the 1971 race is probably best known for its cameo in Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I don't even remember the like motorcycle race part of that movie. I haven't seen it. You've never seen that movie? Mm-mm. Oh, wow. No. It's a book. I mostly just watch movies that have like sixes on IMDb because it's like sounds oh. interesting instead of like watching movies that's that I should have seen system. by now. What's no, it's not. You watch a lot of interesting movies. You like find what? A, something that's rated six out no, of ten? No, I don't intentionally filter by ratings. It's just like, you know, it's just like small movies that are weird and then it's like, oh, that was an interesting movie. 90 minutes. Whatever. Yeah. Yo, you, you don't like Hollywood. I get it. That's not it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not in the mood to watch The Godfather right now. I've never seen any of The Godfathers. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> You've never seen The Godfather? I've seen that um, that Jay Moore movie Mafia that's a parody of oh. The Godfather. <laughs> Jay Moore's Plenty my times. favorite comedian. <laughs> Thompson had been in Los Angeles working on an entirely different story for Rolling Stone magazine about the alleged accidental killing of Mexican-American journalist Ruben Salazar. For context, Salazar was struck and killed by a tear gas canister launched by Los Angeles County Sheriffs while he was covering Chicano protests of the Vietnam War. Some things never change. Thompson's main source for the story was Chicano lawyer and activist Oscar Ocasta. But because Thompson was white and covering a story about the broiling race relations in Los Angeles, the two found it hard to converse openly and alone without interruption. Thus, it was kismet when Sports Illustrated offered him an assignment to write two, a 250-word photo caption piece. What? Dude, that's so <laughs> they sick. sent him to Vegas to write a photo caption? Yeah. Why couldn't the, things used to be so much better? I'm telling you, <laughs> it sucks now. <laughs> now they would have an intern do that. I I they poop out have, 250 words in a Slack. Message. I know. Yeah, the company would probably just uh, fire all the lower level writers and yeah, just replace AI. it with AI. Right? AI would write 250 words now. Everything sucks now. <laughs> So they wanted to write a 250-word photo caption piece for the 1971 <laughs> Mint 400 race. So they took, they gave him a budget, sent him to Vegas, and let him bring a friend. Thompson took the <laughs> Thompson took the opportunity to go to Vegas with Acosta to cover the race and continue to work on his Salazar story. Covering the Mint 400 was difficult for him. The same kicked up dust that made life difficult for drivers hurt the race's visibility to journalists and spectators. In the end, Thompson penned a 2,500 word story from his Vegas experience that was rejected by Sports <laughs> what Illustrated. What are you doing? Well, he's writing a book. Nah. 2,500? That's only five pages. 
Oh, yeah. And the magazine even refused to reimburse him for his expenses. Because I he really racked up a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, Chopson was sent back to the Las Vegas shortly thereafter to cover a narcotics officer's convention. <laughs> These two trips were combined to become Thompson's seminal work, Fear and Loathing, in Las Vegas. I got to read this. You would love it. Yeah. <laughs> the fifth iteration of the race in 1972 featured 390 vehicles this time around and an ever-growing purse of 70 grand, baby. Grand, baby. That year, famed Mercury 7 astronaut Gordon Cooper entered the race uh, with veteran Mel Larson. Nice. But what would seem to be a dream mashup of pioneering ended with their car failing to complete a single lap, unfortunately. Do you think he was like, why is all your food so wet? <laughs> <laughs> you got any powdered... Steak? Mm, this isn't <laughs> chalky at all. It was Fritz Croyer who would take the four-wheeler honors and become the first back-to-back -back champ in the car division. Fritz Croyer! This year also marked the debut of the Girls of the Mint 400, which brought some glitz and acceptable amount of 1970s sexism to the event. The pageant light competition was the brainchild of uh, K.J. Howe, who had joined the Mint's publicity staff in the early 1970s and was looking for another way to further promote the race. Get the gals out in the desert. Applications poured in from North America and Europe. Local media reps culled the list of hundreds down to 10, and from there, the racing committee selected five women to become the Mint 400 girls who would preside over much of the racing activities. Some notable Mint 400 girl alumni include Wonder Woman's Linda Carter, nice. Wheel of Fortune's Vanna White, from and Milwaukee. Really? Yeah. And several Playboy centerfolds of the 1980s. And my mom. <laughs> <laughs> in 1973, the race left the silty soil of Tool Springs and changed to two 200-mile laps south of Vegas near the California border. Of course, not everyone seemed to remember the change in venue. An entire group from the annual parade took a wrong turn oh and headed God. north to the old starting line in Tool Springs before their motorcycle escort realized they were going the wrong way. Guys, <laughs> check the flyer. Read your flyer. Check your phone. What the heck? This early misstep would be a harbinger of things to come in what would be known as the year of the big snow. A combination of rain, sleet, snow, and 50 mile per hour winds wrecked havoc on the race. Most drivers had only packed summer clothes, and as a result, many were later treated for frostbite. Yeah. Additionally, areas of zero visibility and freezing carburetors brought entire sections of the race to a standstill. All these elements led to a finish rate of only 28%. Wow. But, Despite the severe conditions, Joe, Parnelli Jones managed to win his first and only Mint 400 behind the wheel of his big Ollie Ford Bronco. I've seen a picture of this well, thing. I've seen sick. it in person. It's at the, it's at the Peterson. Peterson. Yeah, that's where I... That's where sometimes I Sometimes I mix up pictures <laughs> with stuff I see with my eyes. It wasn't a picture. It was my life. <laughs> uh, if you want to know more about the big Ollie Bronco... Check out Parnelli Jones. We've done an entire episode on the man. Very interesting story. Rufus yeah. Parnell, Parnelli Jones. Rufus Parnell, Parnelli Jones. Chris Parnelli Jones. I got a back tattoo tramp stamp that says that. <laughs> Rufus Parnell, Parnelli Jones. The nineteen four different fonts. Wow. It's it's covering up your old tattoo that said "Contents under pressure." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The 1974 Mint 400 would have the largest purse yet, but. The oil crisis forced the cancellation of the race. Oh. However, after a one-year hiatus, the race returned in 1975. Yay! With a 100-mile course this time, a speed drum that included pit areas, and for the first time, bleachers for spectators. Where? Where are the, ble the Just bleachers? Just out, out there, you know? Just out there. <laughs> Jack Antonoff's band played for spectators. Bleachers. Oh. Um, yep. <laughs> Four-wheel champion of the first Mint 400, Gene Hurst, won again in 1975 and again in 76 with Bobby Farrow. The two drove a Sandmaster Hustler dune That's buggy. Sick. <laughs> and in doing so, Hearst became the first driver to win three times, a record that wouldn't be repeated for over 40 years. Sandmaster Hustler. The hustler. Oh, great. Now I'm on Craigslist looking for Sandmaster Hustlers. <laughs> Sandmaster. Hustler. Hustler. <laughs> Sandmaster. Ooh. Hustler. Seems pretty sick. This is a cool buggy. That's it's a buggy a cool if buggy. I ever saw one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, oh yeah. yeah. This That's what is I like. the kind of kind of stuff I like. <laughs> it looks like the little guy from Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got a friend in me, or I'll be your friend in you, little Mr. Sandmaster Hustler, because I drive you. <laughs> I drive you real good. I drive you real good, Mr. Sandmaster Hustler. I keep you nice and clean. Mm, I'll get you nice dirty, then clean you up. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. One of my favorite things about Indeed is that everything is all in one place. You know, how you connect with people, how you hire people, how you look at resumes, it's all right there on Indeed. It makes it super easy to hire people. And listeners of the show get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash gas. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Just go to Indeed.com slash gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash pass gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's the holiday season. It's the end of the year. Lots of pressure here at work, making a lot of videos. You're probably going through the same thing. Got to get all those tasks done before the holidays. Man, it can really have an effect on you. Point is, this time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress and change. Something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. I think therapy is a great way to help you through those difficult situations. And it isn't just for those who have experienced major trauma. It's for everybody. And BetterHelp can help you do that. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give our sponsor BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. That's kind of a huge thing. BetterHelp is catered to you. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash gas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash past gas thank you very much better help it was around this time the environmental movement of the 1970s began targeting the mint 400 as a result the 1975 budget included an environmental impact study and environmental monitors that seems really early for that kind of stuff but yeah i mean the 70s were a pretty interesting time with stuff like that coming in Mm -hmm. um yeah i mean you can't just like go blasting through like a huge collection of nests yeah or meanwhile something. dupont's just dumping slime into a river yeah <laughs> every not a river every river yeah. all the rivers <laughs> we all have teflon i, feel, I got really high microplastics today you know Did i'm you? feeling it yeah yeah mm, quit chewing on your credit card <sighs> but it's so tasty <laughs> concerned he could lose the support of local politicians and business persons K.J. Howe, now the director of publicity for the race, sent bright red official race jackets to all competitors. These gifts came with a request to wear the jackets as long as they were in town for the Mint 400. The month of the race, downtown Las Vegas was awash in the very visible jackets and convinced city officials to keep backing the race. That's smart. That's very smart. A decade on, despite this support, more of the race's budget had to be spent on environmental concerns. For example, despite tortoise deaths being historically unlikely during the (laughs) Mint 400, a tortoise expert had to be hired to make sure the desert course didn't interfere too much with their habitat. I bet that guy is funny. (laughs) He's like big, thick glasses and a bald (laughs) head. Real droopy face. I like just describing a jacket jacket that's that's too big. (laughs) What if he was just like the hottest guy? He's so hot. Just... mm. Just ripped, yeah, dude. Ripped. Hey, yeah. So not Dana Carvey's no. No. Turtle Man <laughs> not, from not, Master, not Master, Master of the Sky. Jacob Alori. He's like, hi, I'm here to check out the tortoises. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I gotta listen to this guy. <laughs> and then he's like, you see it, and all the girls are like, oh my god. And then he's just like, oh, they're over here. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly, Slowly moving. Slowly moving away. That's hilarious. 
An allowable number of tortoise deaths was set. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh. But fortunately, none were killed that year. Oh, that's convenient. And tortoise-related tragedies continued to be low <laughs> uh, in the event. <laughs> Great. However... Dude, I'm sure they were just killing those things every year. There's no way that they no, didn't dude. hit any of them. Come I, on. There might not be a lot of them. Yeah. I, I, how maybe. many tortoises are just wandering out in the desert? Yeah, man. There used to be a lot more before the mint came through. Dude, yeah. no. You are making that up. I don't... Dude, there... I think... Come on. Officially, yeah, they're going to be like, yeah, we didn't hit any of the last year. Yeah, you guys, right? didn't, you guys didn't You guys hit didn't see any But I did he hit a big... Moving hubcap. Yeah. <laughs> I, hit, I, I hit a rock with legs and a head yeah. and babies. Yeah. <laughs> but no tortoises. Oh, tortoises. Oh. No, no, no. I killed a bunch of turtles. <laughs> <laughs> However, the race continued. Popularity began to make it a victim of its own success. Hmm. The Bureau of Land Management estimated that 100,000 spectators attended the 1985 wow. race and began restricting spectators and spectator access for safety purposes. Hmm. The following year, race officials were brought before the county's Air Pollution Control Commission, boo, who were upset with the Mint 400's tendency to create massive dust clouds. Let's go further out. Yeah, yeah, further out. Huh? Man-made haboobs. Haboobs? It's like a big um, oh, Arab I didn't know that. dust storm. K.J. Howe, who had been promoted again to race director, seemingly strong-armed the commission. I asked her who was going to mitigate the dust when the next dust storm hit the area, and I said that around a million dollars a mile to pave part of the course wasn't going to happen, and that we would just have to cancel the race. The commission called for a recess and later came back to rubber stamp the race and put off their request to pave the course to an unspecified future date. How would paving the desert be better for the environment? I have I no know. idea. It's dumb. Cement is so bad for the environment. <sighs> yeah. To get all the stone. I think it tastes it's, great. Hmm? I think it tastes <laughs> Tastes great? <laughs> Are you a rock monster? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Despite these battles, the thing that finally killed the Mint 400 was not government interference, but a change in casino ownership. Mm -hmm. In 1986, Dell Webb sold the Mint to Jack Binion, oh. owner of the Horseshoe Club Casino. Binion's Horseshoe Club Casino. Yeah. Despite the support of many of the Mint's upper management, Binion wanted to end the event. He believed the influx of competitors and vehicles to Fremont Street had hurt their main business, gambling. So stupid. Racers love gambling. Racers yeah. love gambling. Racers love doing stuff that they shouldn't do. They gamble with their lives. Yeah. He also felt that its gritty, untamed image didn't mesh with the glamour he wanted to be associated with in his casino. Hmm. Uh, nobody thinks Vegas is actually glamorous. It's ironically <laughs> glamorous. Mm -hmm. Contractual obligations kept it going for three more years, but the writing was on the wall. The 22nd Mint 400 held in 1989, shouts to Taylor Swift, was the last of the 20th century. But if there's one thing Las Vegas is good at, it's resurrecting careers. Nice. Nice. Usher. Brittany. Brittany. Celine. Carrot Celine. Top. Cher. Carrot Top. <laughs> Wayne. Wayne. Newton. <laughs> I was like, Lil Wayne has a show? Let's go, dude. <laughs> I would totally see a Lil Wayne residency yeah. in Vegas. And after a 20-year break, the Mint 400 was brought back in 2008. Its savior was a group named Snore. <laughs> <laughs> what? Which stands for Southern Nevada Off-Road uh, Enthusiasts. A nonprofit of off-road racers and their families. The group was founded in 1969, and with an all-volunteer group of officials and staff, it organizes and publicizes off-road racing in the greater Las Vegas area. It's not to be confused with SCORE. That's completely different. different. Yeah, it is different. Part of the Mint 400's comeback included bringing aboard Mad Media, a digital media company specializing in motorsports to cover the race. Owned by producers and brothers Matt and Josh Martelli, Mad Media began producing a television program and relaunched the event. Nevertheless, just four races into its rebirth in 2011, 
Bureau of Land Management officials determined that the race caused too much damage to local vegetation. Instead of appealing this decision, Snore decided the Mint 400 was too big for its nonprofit club to handle, and they sold the race to Mad Media. Fortunately, just in time for the next year's race, a 100-mile race loop now south of Las Vegas was given the official okay by the BLM. I feel like they gave up pretty easily. It could have just been like... Let's well, spend a day looking around. No, no, I mean, it's not a comp. It's like a nonprofit. You know, yeah, it's like, like it's, it's volunteers a, yeah. doing all this it's stuff. It's guys yeah. who like off roading. They were like, "Hey, we should we should form a thing." Yeah, and they kept yeah. it going for a couple of years. So yeah, credit and then to they're them. like, "You know what, guys? I don't want to do this." Oh my god! Thank you for yeah. saying it. I've been wanting to say it for two years. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to drive stuff off road. I got to make all kinds of phone calls. Yeah, this sucks. <laughs> The return of the Mint 400 also brought back an early Mint 400 tradition, motorcycles. Nice! Bikes were banned in 1977, and in the first 10 years of the resurrected race, motorcycles were not included. That changed in the 2019 Mint 400. You gotta have motorcycles. And that same year, Justin Lofton won in the unlimited truck class and joined Greg Hurst as only the second three-time champion in the history of the race. The girls of the Mint have also returned, yes. though now it's dubbed the Miss Mint Contest. In 2020, the Miss Mint winner, Emily Dobrazensky, participated as a co-driver and navigator for a pro UTV team, becoming the first Miss Mint to compete in the race. Cool. cool. I want to be Miss Mint. Miss Mint. Today, the Mint 400 attracts nearly 65,000 people to its race and surrounding events. What was once a dusty, dirty, and seemingly thrown-together day-long endurance test has become a meticulously planned four-day festival. Held every March, a parade still kicks things off, but it's no longer exclusive to old Las Vegas. Trophy trucks and vintage VW Beetles rev their engines from the southern end of the Strip to its final destination of downtown Las Vegas. (laughs) <laughs> this bleeds into the next day's Fremont Street block party, which is followed by two days of racing. That sounds fun. I know. This largely fits with the Mint 400's spectator-friendly ethos. Unlike the Baja 1000 or Dakar, which are point-to-point races, the Mint 400 uses multiple laps over a large course. Fans are able to watch from grandstands at the starting line, which features multiple jumps and hairpin turns for cool. their viewing entertainment. Attendees can also drive to specified areas in the desert to view up close the wild action in the wild. (laughs) I will not redo that. (laughs) (laughs) The the race has also gone to great lengths to rehab its image as more environmentally friendly. The Martellis consider themselves environmentalists and and have said, the whole point of why you off-road is to get out of the city, to get away from the destruction and the stress and the trash and all that. We don't want to see that stuff in our environment. Good for them. That, yeah, dude. I like that Me too. balanced approach. Of course, yeah. you're going to damage. You're going to, with off-road racing especially, uh-huh. you're going to destroy, like, you're going to break some I know, stuff. but, like, a lot of off-roading is about conservation. Conservation, yeah. yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why a lot of trails don't allow UTVs. UTVs because, uh, suck because well, they rip up stuff. They rip up stuff, people but people don't re- respect the trails. Yeah. 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 Stay on the trail. Stay on the trail. Stay on the trail. Since 2017, the Martelli brothers have held a pre-race desert cleanup day. Every year, literal tons of trash is removed from the desert, the vast majority of which has nothing to do with off-roaders or the Mint 400. This has also led to much more harmonious relationship with the Bureau of Land Management. Nice. Nice. You scratch their back, they scratch yours. Yeah, hey, turns out these guys aren't so bad after all. Like Vegas itself, the Mint 400 lit up the desert with its high-risk, high-reward propositions and threw in the star power of Hollywood amateurs as well as grizzled veterans of off-road racing. That it could go away for 20 years, only to be brought back by a group of volunteers, is a testament to the enthusiasm and fan passion that exists for off-road racing. Uh Uh-huh. A passion that now extends, James, to a more active role in preserving and protecting the environment in which off-roading thrives. Ironically, in 2009, just one year after the Mint 400 returned, the Mint Hotel unfortunately closed for good, a victim of the Great Recession. Damn it. Though the event is now sponsored by BF Goodrich Tires, the Mint Hotel's legacy is forever ensconced in its namesake race. And with the Mint 400 now part of the new Unlimited Off-Road Racing Series, it appears that the Great American Off-Road Race 
is here to stay. Noise. I kind of want to go. Yeah, I want to go now. Yeah, go to that block party. Yeah. Now I understand what my roommate was talking about. Yeah, finally. I'm hungry. Finally. I, I'm hungry now. Well, lunch is real close. close. Guys, we're so hungry. We're going to go eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but first, we got some listener mail. Yeah. Hey, Pass Gas. I'm Lucas from Milwaukee. Hey, hey Lucas. Joe's so from. That, dude, do you guys know that's where Joe's from? Go to a fish People fry. always ask me, do you know Lucas? Yeah. I don't. Do. <laughs> Thanks for making this podcast every week. I've been listening from the start and always enjoy the pure comedy and automotive history you guys give us. I recently turned 16 and got my license and I've enjoyed working on and driving my 2004 VW Golf. Two door, five speed. What? Let's go, dude. It's fun. That's a Mark IV. I remember in one episode, Joe talked about the David Hobbs Honda dealership in Glendale, Wisconsin. I work across the street from it and love seeing this important part of automotive history and the fascinating origin story in my hometown. That said, for a future episode, could you guys dive deep into the rickshaw run? Hmm. Also, I'd love to hear more about Joe's life growing up in Milwaukee, such as places he'd go, where he grew up, went to school, <laughs> etc. As always, keep it juiced and fired up. And let's take Minnesota down. Okay, nice try, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> let's try right Dude, in, Joe, you freaking dork. This rickshaw run, <laughs> the rickshaw run is an event where teams drive rickshaws yeah. along uh, various routes across India. India? Uh, yeah. This okay. is sick. I want to I want to see that. Yeah, yeah let's do that. Uh, can you please do an entire episode on how dope Joe was <laughs> in high school? <laughs> So Thank you, Lucas. Uh, yeah. That's a great suggestion. I think we should do it as an episode, if not a video. Yeah, rickshaws. That's For awesome. Sure. Hit us up at passgas at dunamedia.com. Maybe we'll read your email on the air. Thank you so much to our writer this week, Jordan Pomaville. Our producers, Christina Felsky, Paulo Mara, and Nick Giamuso. Right. The Moose and the Mara. Moose, Moose and Mara, Mara, baby. Follow James at James Pumphrey. Follow Joe at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes if you'd like. Let's go eat some lunch. Let's go eat some <laughs> lunch. Mm, no.